once again, uh, happy Mother's Day. And uh, I know my mom's going to be watching online at some point this week. So I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. You are the best mom in the world. And, uh, you know, uh, we're going to start off in Judges chapter 2. Let's go to Judges chapter 2 here. Uh, it was awesome. Thank you, my dear brother. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, last week, uh, Jason did preach for us, and he preached on Joshua. And I thought we could continue with that and go on to now the book of Judges. But Matthew and I decided to start a 1 Samuel series. And uh, for the next several Sundays, we'll be talking about 1 and 2 Samuel. And today we want to give a runner-up and an introduction to it, as we really believe that this book can edify the church at this time. Now, just to kind of give a run-up to Judges chapter 2, and we're going to start off our reading in verse 10. We understand from yesterday, uh, last week's Sunday, when Jason did preach on Joshua, that Joshua was the successor of Moses. And Moses had a deep conviction that he wanted to make sure that God's people had leadership so they would not be sheep without a shepherd. And then Joshua comes into the scene, and he leads the people to what his own mentor could not do, and he gets them to the promised land. And yet after a series of 31 battles that they win, they conquer the promised land, but Joshua does not have the same conviction as Moses. And then what it gives birth to is the book of Judges, which Judges is also synonymous with leaders. So Judges is the book of leaders. But it's ironic because the book is lacking spiritual leadership. Because really what the theme of the book of Judges is, is that there was no king at that time, and the people did whatever they wanted to. And yes, they didn't have a physical king, but more importantly, God wasn't their king. And that's so emblematic of our world today, that people don't want to make Jesus Lord. Yes, they want Jesus to be their Messiah or their Savior, but they don't want him to be Lord of, his, of their life. But we know that our king is King Jesus. And then we know what happens in Judges, a series of leaders that God raises on up, we find the theme of their leadership here in verse 10 of Judges chapter 2. The Bible says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had bought them, brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he swore to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up leaders. So over here, really what we see in the book of Judges is that God's people got so far away from God that they started to worship other idols, the Baals and the Asherahs. And it said that it got so bad that they were in deep distress. And when you're in distress, you have two different options. You can escape to sin, which sadly what they chose to do, or you can escape to God, have a spiritual escape, and be with God, and God can comfort you in your distress so that you can be comforted and then go comfort others. And was that not the story of all of us before we became disciples? Yeah. That we were in distress, and then we called out to God. As it says in Psalm 18, verse 6, In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Isn't it awesome to serve a God that is listening, that he never sleeps? 24-7, when you call on him, he wants to answer you, even when you're in distress. You know, I got this passage from my sister TJ in Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. Uh, she was sharing her quiet time in the single soul Bible, uh, Bible talk uh, uh, chat, and I was inspired by it. Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, in the message version. I know the sisters love the message version. It says, then I'll go back to where I came from, talking about God, until they come to their senses, when they finally hit rock bottom. Maybe they'll come looking for me. 
That is the story of every single person. God's going to allow it or make it happen for you to hit rock bottom. But then maybe, you see, the one thing that God won't take away from you, as Christoph preached very eloquently last week, is your free will. So you have a decision to make. Are you going to come to your senses today? Just don't hear a preacher today. Hear the words of God today. And make a decision, even though you hit rock bottom, God wants to redeem you today. And that's the title of my message, Rock Bottom Redemption. And our first point, purpose in the pain. You know, it is Mother's Day. And John 16, verse 21 says, A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. You know, us as men, we're never going to experience the pain of giving childbirth. But it's amazing that moms want to have more than one child. <laughs> Even going through that incredible pain. Why? Because they, when they go through it, they understand the purpose of it. Because without pain, there could be no life. And after the child is born, there is no more sorrow or pain, but joy. But sometimes, you know, we grow up and we give our moms and dads some sorrow later on. But they do feel that, that, that joy initially when that baby is born. And today I thought to really talk about this point, purpose in the pain, we could talk about the mother of hope, Hannah, in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Let's turn over there. little pixelated picture there. Hannah. Now, let, let's now, we just talked about Judges. Now, the next book in the Bible is Ruth. I think most people think Ruth is just a book that's great for Women's Day. Uh, but it's a lot, it's a lot, a lot deeper than just that, right? So we understand Ruth is during the time of Judges, which is an incredibly dark time. I hope you're ready for a Bible study today. We're a Bible church. We, we love the Bible, right? And we got to know the Bible because the Bible says that without knowledge, my people will perish. So it's imperative for us to get into the scriptures, understand what the scriptures are saying. So if you're ready to take some notes, have a Bible study today. So we know that Ruth finds Boaz. And they get married. And they give birth to then a man named Obed. Then Obed marries. And they give birth to a man named Jesse. And it's awesome, Jesse Van Wilson, Erica just got married, it's good enough for the Van And I thought the Hoaglands, Jesse Hoagland did an incredible job in our welcome today, <laughs> and Lindsay. And we know that Jesse then marries and has many different sons, but one of his sons, the youngest son, is David. So the theme of Ruth as well, even though darkness is looming with God's people, God is still working because we know there is no king like King David in the Old Testament. And then what happens now? We come to Samuel. And a quick overview of Samuel. We know that Samuel is indeed the last judge. And then he then gives birth to the king's period when he anoints Saul as king. And to my knowledge, it is indeed that Samuel is the writer of Samuel. But there's some different parts that are written by different prophets. One is Nathan, another is Gad. And you might know Nathan because he was the man who rebuked David after he was in terrible sin with Bathsheba. So 1 and 2 Samuel in the original Hebrew Old Testament was actually one big scroll. But since it was so large, they divided it into two in the English Bible. And there's some main characters in it. It takes place from 1100 BC to 970 BC. And the main characters are Samuel, Saul, and David. And we see the rise and fall of Saul, and we see the rise and fall of David as well. And really, it tells the story of how God's kingdom went from 12 autonomous tribes, that's what we saw in the book of Judges, to then a unified kingdom. But then sadly, after Rehoboam, who was the grandson of David, it then gets divided once again. And there's some major themes in Samuel that I think we have to really look out for as we continue to study out Samuel. The first theme, God opposes the proud but raises the humble. The second theme, despite human evil, God is always working. 
And then the third theme, which is all throughout the Old Testament, is the prophecies of the Messianic King, which is Jesus Christ. Now we have the overview. Let's study out 1 Samuel chapter 1. And talk about the mother of hope, Hannah. To illustrate our first point, purpose in the pain. 1 Samuel chapter 1, in verse 1. Everyone there? The Bible says, There's a certain man from Ramathim, a Zophite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Let's stop right there. There's already an issue. Sometimes we can look at the Bible and think God sanctioned these things, but the Bible is just brutally honest. And it tells us the good, bad, and ugly. We know the plan of God is one man and one woman. That's it. So I know it's just for giving me an amen on that one right there. Amen. And the brothers give me an amen too, amen. That's God's plan. And yet, Alcana was in sin right here. And when you're in sin, it just gives you more problems. More sin, more problems. That's the way it goes. And what happens here is we see that Penina was able to have children, but Hannah could not. Let's continue reading in verse 3. <clears throat> year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord, Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her. You know a brother really loves you, or your husband really loves you, or your boyfriend really loves you when they're sharing their food with you, amen? And it's hard for me to share my food, but I'm going to share my food with my wife. And my favorite food is French fries, and she knows. When she asks me, and it's crazy, I know French fries are my favorite food. But I'm going to share with my wife. If someone else asks me, I'll have second thoughts. But it goes on. Verse 5. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Hannah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you? Then ten sons, the answer is no. Elkanah was pretty out of touch here. So what we see happen is that we see Hannah's womb was closed by the Lord. And Penna was able to have many, many children. And sadly, day after day, Penna will provoke her and irritate her. And we know that we have an adversary and that adversary is Satan. And the Bible says day and night he tries to accuse the brothers and sisters of the light and irritate and provoke them. And what's amazing about this, the scriptures aren't clear, but we can make some type of judgment that it wasn't for any sin that God closed her womb. It was just God allowing her to be tested. And we see that through the test, it, just, it says that it was not just for a little while, but it was year after year. And we understood back then, even today, it was a big deal to have children and to be barren. Can you imagine the pain? Put yourself in the shoes of Hannah this morning. The pain she was feeling. But then to have her sister wife provoke her to become depressed and despondent and because she couldn't even eat. She was probably tempted to be bitter, tempted to lose faith, tempted to be angry. But let's see, what does Hannah do next? Let's read verse 9. Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, either the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house, in her deep anguish, rock bottom, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. 
And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. So what we see here is that the Bible says in her deep anguish, that's when she cries out to God. She hits rock bottom and she goes to God and she wants to find the purpose in the pain. And we know what happens after she prays this, that from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12 to 20, we know that God does answer her prayer. And she's able then to give birth to Samuel, who his name means God has heard. And Samuel was the man or the prophet that gave birth to the company of prophets. He's also the man then to raise up King David to be the greatest king that Israel will ever know. But it came through a woman's deep anguish. And maybe what was happening, because what we see in her prayer is a pure motive of heart, where she says, this child that will be born, if you allow him to be born, I would dedicate it to, to you, God. I would dedicate this child to the Lord. And the Bible says after he's weaned, he served in the temple. That means he was probably three or four years old. And she gave him on over to be trained in the temple. It showed that maybe what God was trying to weigh for Hannah is a pure motive of heart. Maybe what God was trying to weigh in delaying was to purify her so that she wouldn't make the blessing into a curse. Where she may have took this child and forsook the Lord, but God allowed her to go through the pain to find purpose in it. You know, I believe it's the same thing for us. You may be going through some pain right now, and God wants you to find purpose in it. Maybe you can relate to Hannah in a real way praying for a child. Or maybe you're looking to see new things happen in your life or be, have a fruitful Bible talk, whatever it may be, but God wants you to have a pure motive because motives matter. Let's go to James chapter 4. James 4. James 4 and verse 1. It says in verse 1 of James 4. The Bible says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Then you spend what you get on your pleasures. You know, over here the Bible says that at times we don't see things happen in our life because we don't pray. But then at times we do pray, but we have the wrong motives, and we want to spend what we want to get from God on our own pleasures. And the Bible clearly teaches that motives actually matter. That everything we do is to give glory to God. But that's a very tough teaching, and it's so important for us to have faith through that process. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Purpose in the pain. Hebrews 11, in verse 6, the Bible says in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So the Bible here says it's impossible to please God without faith. And he said that you must believe he exists and that he will reward you as you earnestly seek after him. Doesn't that sound incredible? To be rewarded by God Almighty. But we have to ask ourselves, what exactly is this reward? Well, let's go to Genesis 15. 
Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Genesis 15, in verse 1, what is the reward? Well, the Bible says in verse 1, uh, the calling of Abram to Abraham with his covenant with God. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in the vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. This scripture teaches us our reward is God himself. That the fact when you earnestly seek him, the promise is you are going to have a relationship with him. The promise is that you're going to be saved. That you're, if God came back today, you will be in heaven. If you die today, you will go to heaven. Does that not just fire you on up? That God is your reward. But some of us, it might be esteemed because you want some more. You want more than God. But God says through it all, whatever I give you is just sprinkles on top anyways. The fact that you can come and have a relationship with God, that is your reward. And we can't forget that even in Luke chapter 10, when they come back to Jesus have successful ministry time, Jesus said, don't forget that your name's written in heaven. I saw Satan fall down from heaven like lightning. Wow. And he says, what you should rejoice in is that your name is written in heaven, that I am your reward, that one day you're going to see God and say, glory, glory to the Lord God Almighty. Are you guys with me here? Everything we do is for God's glory. It's not for our glory. The baptisms, the restorations, where we share our faith, our jobs, our kids, our families. Everything we do is not about you. It's about God. And that's the only way you can find purpose in the pain. It's, 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 it's the only way. No one's going to go through pain if it's just for something they don't really care about. But if you really care about giving glory to God, you're going to stay faithful in this gauntlet that is called Christianity. You know, I thought it was amazing. Uh, this week we did celebrate a lot of graduates. And we had, we had a chance to have dinner with the whole uh, Stevens family over here. Dad, Jeremiah, mom, Cammie, older sister, Mikaeli, and Shaylee, the younger sister. And it was awesome that, uh, you know, Caden graduated from USC. We all believed in him and he made it, amen. And uh, Jeremiah and the family, they allowed us to come, me and Trey and Elijah, Rainier and Jacob. We were able to have dinner with them. And uh, I thought it was so incredible just to see their, the dynamic of family. And uh, I know I was encouraged, and I know they were, but I thought today was just so special to see Kate introduce his older sister, Mikaeli. And for her to share that last year was their first service. Wow. And now she's a sold-out disciple. Wow. And I was just so moved by her community. She literally illustrates Hannah perfectly. Where she went through it, had to pray through it, and if you notice what she shared, if even if God didn't deliver her, even if God didn't allow her to have a child, the Lord is still Lord. And I think what's amazing that we all do hit rock bottom before we become disciples. And I think today is going to be incredible as we're going to see many people get baptized. As we're going to see, as I said earlier, Jameer is going to get baptized today. Uh, Mars and Brian already got baptized. Noah's getting baptized. Ashley's getting baptized. Segundo's getting baptized. And Melody's getting baptized. And I, I can bet you, all of them have a similar story. That they hit rock bottom before they cry out to the Lord. And then once they hit rock bottom, that's when they were in distress and they called out to God and God wanted them to find purpose in the pain. And it was awesome today to see Pelly get restored. And I got a chance to be in some of his studies this past week. And you know, it's incredible. You know, Pelle is actually a professional soccer player. He didn't share that. And he had an opportunity to play in his home country, Belize, professional soccer. But because of that, we don't have a church in Belize. So he turned down the, the offer to be a sold-out disciple. 
And what's amazing is, you know, apparently he did get baptized in the East Region two years ago. And you can ask him in the fellowship, he had to go through a lot to come back. But he found purpose in the pain. And now Pele is back, and he's restored in Christ, and now he's our brother, amen. You know, how do we do this? Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, it's Mother's Day, and it's a great celebration for many. But maybe for some here, there is some hurt. As maybe your mother's past, or a child that you desired is no longer with us. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, I think it's an amazing passage that could really inspire us all. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our troubles, so we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. You know, it's an amazing passage here that really teaches the purpose of pain. Where it says that you could be comforted by God and then you could go out and comfort anyone in any trouble. So the thing about pain, pain is pain. So Whatever pain you go through, if you allow God to comfort you, you can then help others get comforted. And that is why God is having some of us go through pain right now. So you can be comforted by God. And then comfort others as well. You know, I like all different types of music. I don't know if anyone's a fan of Green Day here. You know. Some, some people might think I don't listen to Green Day, but I do. And uh, a famous song they have is Wake Me Up When September Ends. You know guys know that song, right? You know, that song is, is actually about his father passing away. And his father died in September. But the video, if you've ever watched it, is actually about a couple who has a tough time, and then the man dies in the video. But I thought it's an amazing video because it does really illustrate this passage. He's singing about his pain, about his father passing away. But the video is about another different type of pain. Showing us how we could comfort people in any different type of pain because we understand the pain that we went through in the past. And I think right now it's a time for us to really find purpose in the pain. What is your pain today? Be like the mother of hope. Because we know the Bible says that we could glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, yeah. perseverance character, and character hope, and hope will not put you to shame. Because yeah. one day you will see God in heaven if you stay faithful. Yeah. And I want to put it before you, if Hannah could do it, yeah. if Mikaili can do it, yeah. Yeah. if Pele can do it, yeah. you can do it as well, amen? Yeah. When we find purpose in the pain, we can do point number two, find life in the light. Let's go to 1 Samuel 3. So for the sake of time, since we did share the Good News Network, I will be skipping 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're going to be staying out for midweek. So for the sisters, you want to watch it on um, YouTube, you can watch it on YouTube. But we're going to read 1 Samuel 3 here, and our second point is life is in the light. Let's read verse 1. The Bible says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord unto Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, he was lying down in his usual place. Let's stop right there. So here now, we are seeing one of the other characters, Eli, who was one of the leaders during this time. And the Bible here says that in those days, there were not many visions, and the word of the Lord was rare. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it talks about how Hannah has this song where she sings after Samuel's born. It's very similar to Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, when we see Zechariah sings about John the Baptist, 
and Mary sings about Jesus. And in that, at the end of her song, is a prophecy about Jesus. And that was the first prophecy since Judges chapter 5 with Deborah. When Deborah sang the song, when the princes of Israel lead and the people willing to follow, we praise God. Wow. So what's happening here in Judges, that was around 1235 B.C. Now in Samuel, it's 1070. That's 165 years with no prophecy. Totally, yes, it's true. The word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. But it's still very emblematic of our time. That yes, many people will go to church even today, but the word is still rare. As 2 Timothy 4 says, that people want to, there become a time where people want to not put up with sound doctrine, but instead they want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. And not really hear the word of the Lord. And Amos 8 verse 11 says, There will come a time where there will not be a famine of food, but a famine of the word of God. Yeah. And that was a prophecy of what we see as church history yeah. and our present church. And yes, indeed, that many people just like Eli are going to their usual place, going to their usual place of worship. But sadly, the word of the Lord is still rare. Wow. That many are not hearing what it really means to be a sold-out disciple of Jesus. But what happens? Even though that the word was rare, there is still hope. And continue to read. In verse 3. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in his usual place, down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. So over here, what we see in verse 3 and 4 is we see that the lamp of God that was in the holy place had not yet gone out. And we understand that you know, the lamp was in the holy place in the temple, and it was, a, it was a thing that gave the source of light in the temple. And we understand that that was supposed to represent God and his church, as the Bible says, we are the light of the world. And in Revelation 1, in verse 20, wow. talks about how the churches are the lampstands. And it said, even in the darkness, even though there's not much going on, there's still hope. Yeah. The lamp has not yet gone out. And that's why I believe every single disciple needs to be. Yeah. They need to be a light in their campus. Yeah. They need to be a light in their high school. Yeah. They'd be a light over there in their workplace. They'd be a light over there in their families and show even though it's a dark time, even though the word of the Lord is still rare, that there's still hope, that there's still a flicker of light, that the lamp is going to shine bright because their disciples still willing to share their faith wherever they go so the word of God won't be rare anymore and more can understand what the truth is and become a sold out disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then it says that it's a crazy scene. Eli, the supposed to be the high priest, is lying down asleep. And it says that he's next to the Ark of God. We know the Ark of God is supposed to be a symbol of the promise that God made with Moses. And in it was the Ten Commandments, the golden jar of manna, and Aaron's bud, budded staff. And on top of the Ark of God was the mercy seat, where there was angels called cherubim that are looking into the seat, looking into the mercy seat. First Peter chapter 1 says, angels don't even understand how much God loves us. How can you be so merciful towards us? And that's what the mercy was supposed to represent, the mercy of God, the grace of God, that he will allow us to be disciples. And in the, between the cherubim was something called Shekinah, was this is where God will speak through, and that's where the glory of God was at. And Eli was asleep in the presence of God. And it says that his eyes became weak, and we know that Eli was a heavy man, most likely he had diabetes. And what happened was that's supposed to be a physical representation of his spiritual walk, that he was no longer being the leader of God's people. 
and he was asleep in the presence of God. But as disciples, we can do the same thing. We can come to church. We can come to midweek. We can come to Devo. Come to our D times and be in the presence of God, but be asleep spiritually. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I'm, it's a long week. I can sense a living being. Some of you guys are tired. I can see in your face. That's okay to be physically tired. I'm tired. I woke up today at 5 30. I was like, man, I am, I'm tired. I had to just get up and walk right out, get some fresh air. Because if I hit that snooze, I ain't waking up. It's okay to be physically tired, but we cannot be spiritually tired. We can't fall asleep at this time. Because the word of the Lord is still rare. We need to share with more people and help them understand what it really means to obey God. But then what was God's plan? Because Eli was not rejected. Raise up Samuel. First Samuel chapter 3. Continue reading. Verse 4. The Bible says, Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, and I call, go back and lie down. So he went and laid down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid down his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling at, as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the, the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears, hears about it tingle. So over here we see the call of Samuel. And it's amazing over here, we see that as he's being called by God, he thought that he was being called by Eli. And he kept going to Eli, and Eli was saying, hey, man, I, I didn't call you. And I think it's the same thing we could do as disciples. Or even if you are a guest here today, do you think you were invited by someone? You were invited by God. God wanted you here. And for disciples, you think that God, that, that your disciples call you to lead that Bible talk? That your evangelist is calling you to disciple that person? That your friend wants you to do? No, no, it's God that's calling you. And if you believe that, if you believe that it's God who's called you to be here, it's God that wants you to study the Bible, it's God that wants you to lead that Bible talk, it's God that wants you to disciple that person. You're going to answer and be like Samuel and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You know, 1 Samuel 3, verse 7, the Holman version, it says, Now Samuel had not yet experienced the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So really what the scripture is trying to teach us is that Samuel, although he was in the church, although he was in the presence of God, he has not yet experienced God because the word was not revealed to him. How relatable is that? 21 years of my life, I grew up in the church. In the womb, I was already in the church. And yet, I did not experience God because I never heard the word of the Lord in the church. Wow. Instead, I heard the words of men and not the words of God. And that is happening even now. There's some stats that says... In Christianity today, they took a poll and said 80% of churchgoers don't read their Bible daily. And here's a Bible that's a little bit dusty. And you, can, you know, when things are a little dusty, you can put a little inscription on it. It says, read me. And I think that is the challenge that I'll obviously to take over here. To start studying the Bible. Get into the Word of God. Because for me, when I grew up as a religious person, I never got into the Word of God. I, did, I couldn't tell you why I should become a disciple. I couldn't tell you what baptism was all about. I couldn't tell you what it meant to have faith in God. But then finally, a disciple came to me. 
and I understood what it meant to seek God with all my heart, to make the Bible my standard, to become a disciple, to seek first the kingdom, cross over from the darkness to the light, compelled by the love of Christ, and July 31st, 2016, I got baptized into Christ. What did you come to experience this morning? Do you want to experience God? And really what I want to encourage you to do that, you got to study the Bible. you got to get into the Word of God so that you can understand what it means to have life in the light. Now, some of us have been studying the Bible. Or some of us may have walked away. And it's time for decisions. Are you going to be like Hannah? And Hannah was willing to do whatever it takes to follow God. What is the one thing you know God's going to call you to give up? What is that one thing you know that God wants you to sacrifice? Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to put God first? Can I, I'll tell you right now, Mark chapter 10, there was a rich young ruler that was called to give up everything for God. But he didn't want to do it, and Jesus says that with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible with God. Do you know that you can do this with your own strength? And the only way you can get strength is to be by being committed to the word of God. I want to inspire us and challenge us. Don't leave today without saying, just like Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I'm going to get into the word of God. I'm going to do a Bible study. And whatever God calls me to give, I'm going to do it because I know that to him is all the glory. You know, we see over here that there was an emphatic call to Samuel as God calls his name twice. It's Samuel, Samuel. And we know that's the same thing for us. In 1 Peter 2 verse 9, it says that we were called out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And I think it's so amazing just to be here for Mother's Day and to... Think about all the moms who've dedicated themselves to being the light and to see how has it really inspired their siblings or inspired their daughters or sons. And I think about Julie Saunders over here. You know, Julie's been a disciple for 30 years. And then last year she was able, through being dedicated, baptize her daughter. Tina signed out. Tina's a sold out disciple of Jesus. But then it, it also goes the other way. Children can also inspire their parents. And I can't think, I can't help but think about Melody. You know, Zachariah told me that there have been many times Melody has studied the Bible. But then today, Finally, she's made the decision. And Ma Melody, she's been committed. Yeah. She's been to every service, every leader's meeting. And she came to every leader's meeting. Some of us don't come to every She came to every leader's meeting. And today, Melody, Zachariah's mom, will be baptized into Christ. How are these women doing? Well, they made decisions to live in the light. And that's really our desire of a church, is Acts 2, 42, 47, to have a church that's devoted. And I think right now it's time for us to rededicate ourselves, consecrate ourselves, and think where do we have to be devoted in the light once again. Maybe it's confession and renouncing our sins. Maybe it's our commitment to the means of the body, or to contribution and special missions, or discipling times. We have to live in the light so we can see God do incredible things. And I think it was amazing just to see the Good News Network, to see that God wants to do great things all around the world. It says that at the end of this passage we just read, he's going to do something that's going to make your ears tingle. And I think this week, to see over 20 baptisms, God is doing something. Yeah that wants to make everyone that hears have an ear that tingles. Why is that? Because this city is in need of redemption. This whole world is in need of redemption. 
Many people have hit rock bottom, but only through disciples who find purpose in the pain. Only through disciples who make a decision to live in the light. We can see all around the world rock bottom redemption and to God be the glory.